Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kate Brandt. I lead Google's Global Sustainability Program, and it's my honor to be here with you today. I'd like to introduce our very special panel that we have to talk about the new film. So we have Joe Hansen from It's Okay to Be Smart. Uh, we have, yes, come on out, Joe. And we have the directors of the film, Bonnie Cohen and John Shank. And of course, the star of the film, former Vice President Al Gore. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you, Great Kate. To be Absolutely. Here. Thank you. All right. So I wanted to start us off with you, former Vice President Gore. You know, I know it's been a little over a decade since the original film was released. Tell us a little bit about why now. Why did you want to make the sequel at this time? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having us here and great to be with so many Googlers. Uh, thank you for watching the film. We thought that the 10 year anniversary would be a, a good time to ask the audience for permission to come back and say what's new. And it turns out there are a couple of really big new things. Number one, the climate related extreme weather events are a lot more numerous and unfortunately more destructive. But secondly, we've got the solutions now. Solar and wind, electricity have come down incredibly fast in price, uh, and electric cars are becoming available, uh, the, new, the new consumer version of Tesla is about to come out, all of the major manufacturers are about to introduce them, batteries are coming down. So we have the ability to solve this now, and I think it's important to convey that message, and it's one of the reasons why uh, people come away from watching uh, Bonnie and John's film feeling hopeful but also feeling an increased sense of urgency. Absolutely. And, and Bonnie and John, you know, I know you took up the mantle from Davis Guggenheim, who directed the first film. I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit about, did that influence your process at all, or was there anything that really changed in the approach that you took to the film, looking at it, you know, a decade on? Um, well, we stand, Bonnie and I, in making this film, really stand on the shoulders of An Inconvenient Truth. It was a monumental moment in environmental history. It really, um, you know, gave us the language of, that many of us use to talk about the climate change, the climate crisis. Um, so um, we were a little intimidated when we, when we got the call to get involved with An Inconvenient Sequel. But we were quite excited for the reasons that, that Al just mentioned, um, to, to Try to have a whack at uh, telling telling a new kind of story, and Bonnie and I have um, a history of doing observational documentaries, really doing kind of fly on the wall cinema verite approach to our films. And as soon as we met Al and and got the the the, the briefing about what he just described in terms of the climate crisis and the solutions, we felt like we could really make a new type of story where we followed him around and saw the world through his eyes and experience the day-to-day -day drama that he, that he, that he um, goes through in order to try to bring solutions. Yeah, and, and Bonnie, how much did you guys know about climate going into the film? Well, you know, we made a film in back in 2012 called The Island President, which was a film about the former uh, first democrat democratically elected president of the Maldives, which if you know anything about the Maldives, it's the lowest lying island country in the world. Um, they're probably the most vulnerable um, amongst the low-lying island nations to climate change. And uh, so in the making of that film, we got quite an education about adapting to climate change uh, and, and what, what's at stake, really. Uh, so, and I actually think the making of that film was one of the main reasons participants sought us out. It's, um, they, they wanted to work with a directing team that knew something about this and already had a passion for it. So um, we had a bit of a leg up in that regard, but 
boy, what we didn't know really became clear as soon as we headed down to Nashville to hear the 10-hour version of Al's slideshow. <laughs> so, so speaking of the slideshow... I'll be showing that later. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of the slideshow, you know, I, I know yeah. that, that it really truly plays a starring role in, in both films, as do your climate, climate leadership trainings. H about how many times at this point have you given that climate leadership training? Oh, ab about, let's see, 37 times now. Yeah. Um, and I've given the slideshow countless thousands of times. Yeah. And, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, I know a lot of people have gone through that training now. What are a couple of examples of really inspiring actions that you've seen people take following participating in the training? Well, the first thing that's, well, there are so many. Uh, the, the woman who headed the Paris negotiation, Christiana Figueres, went through the, the first large tri climate training program I had. The first one was in my barn at the farm. Uh, but the first big one was in Nashville, and Christiana went through that and later on became the head of the whole negotiation. Um, at the other end of, uh, of that spectrum, I think of uh, an 11-year-old girl who went through the Denver training several months ago, and I almost thought she was too young to go through the training. But two weeks later, uh, <laughs> clicked on a video uh, on uh, YouTube, uh, and uh, it had gone viral, um, and she, had go she went to a town hall meeting of her Republican member of Congress and, and got the mic, and she had her uh, questions on the iPad, and she was just giving him the business on climate, <laughs> and uh, I was so inspired. <laughs> and, uh, and she ended by inviting him to come to her science class the following week where she was going to present the entire slideshow, but he was busy <laughs> that day. Wow, wow. So Joe, I wanna get you in here. So I know you, of course, also do a lot of communicating about climate through your work. Can you talk a little bit about how you like to approach educating people about climate who really aren't familiar with the issue? So as, as an EDU creator, it's an interesting place to be on the front lines because, uh, you, you know, very few of us are climate scientists. Uh, I'm a biologist, but as a scientist and an educator, that, that, that combination, that experience is a really interesting responsibility and challenge. Uh, in all of my videos, whether it's climate or otherwise, the, the most important lesson that I try to get across the message is that it's okay that you don't know this. I think that that is such an important part for people. They feel intimidated by the weight and the history of climate science, and, and they feel afraid to maybe even take the first steps to understand it. And that's what makes it so easy to kind of just maybe do what our, our favorite political leader does or the way that we voted last or maybe just not even pay attention at all. So that's the most important thing is to help people build that confidence, uh, to give them a kind of a positive education experience. If you can get through that, I think that's the biggest hurdle to kind of getting people to do the next things, which are act and, and enact solutions in our own life and, you know, get on the phone and, and write emails and all the truth to power things that we need to do. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and speaking of action, you know, John, for you, obviously, you know, one of the roles of impact film is to really inspire people to take action. You know, how do you guys think about how you ensure that this film really drives people to, to act on climate? Well, um, you know, Bonnie and I, again, are, are, are big believers in, that, that films are, you know, really... At, at their core, emotional vehicles that, that they, they, they really can um, wake people up and, and uh, through the power of story, which by the way, uh, participant media which produced the film, that's, that's really kind of their basic reason for being, is that Jeff Skoll is a big believer that the power of story, especially combined with a social cause, is just a magical combination and obviously an inconvenient truth. Uh, prove that many times over, and we're hoping that our film can uh, follow in the footsteps of that. We really feel like, as, as Al says at the end of the film, something's happened with the climate crisis and the solutions to it, which is it's, it's flipped over from being a um, kind of a 
a partisan debate and kind of with this kind of tribalism. And something's happening now where it's now become more of a social issue and in, in the in, in really more like the civil rights issue or the suffrage issue or, or recently the, the gay rights uh, movement. And people know, because they've lived with the, the information for, for long enough now, they know what the right thing is. And they're starting to make decisions at the local level and their companies. I mean, look at Google, the, you know, yourselves, you're doing amazing work in the sustainable energy. Um, uh, and, and, and young people know this and they're, and they're starting to get on board from a grassroots level. And we tell that story in the film. We, 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 it's evident in, in, through Al's eyes as he goes around the world and talks to people and tries to, to move the needle on, on this debate. You see the energy as it's growing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and for you, former Vice President Gore, you know, when, you, when you're talking to individuals, what do, you, what do you think is the most important thing that people can be doing in their everyday lives to be taking an action on climate? How do you empower them to really take it on? I encourage people first to learn, learn about it, and this movie is a good way to learn about it. There's a book of the same title out today as well. Go to the website, inconveniencesequel.com. Did I mention the website, inconveniencesequel.com? <laughs> and you can buy advanced tickets there also. Um, the movie is you, opening today. Yes. <laughs> in LA. Uh, in LA and New York, and then uh, in all other cities uh, a week from today. Uh, but, you know, knowledge is power, and knowledge can make you confident in your way of communicating. So that's a, a first step. And then use your voice when the conversations on climate. You don't have to be mean or aggressive or hostile or anything, but be persistent. I saw this happen in the, in, uh, the civil rights movement when it was gaining momentum in the South where I was growing up. And it was, that cause was won in conversations, millions of them, uh, before the laws changed. Uh, secondly, use your vote. Uh, and not just your vote, but all of the tools you have available to you as a citizen in our democracy. It's true that big money plays a toxic role in our politics now, but we can still clear the bar for convincing elected officials that they've got to do what the people want. If enough people uh, are willing to communicate forcefully and tell candidates that this is important to you, and then third, use your choices in life. If you go into the marketplace and insist upon a, a more climate-friendly alternative, yes, that will help you reduce your personal impact, but it also sends a powerful signal to, to business. Uh, and it's not an accident that businesses in almost every market sector are now advertising that they're greener than their competition because they're hearing from enough people now that they realize it, it, it's important and can be the difference between profit and loss. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Bonnie, I know we were talking a little bit backstage about another form of action that people are taking, which is user-generated content, and that that played an important role for you guys in making the film. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's also true of Al slideshow as compared to 2006, you know, where it was mostly stills and graphs. Now the the slideshow is filled with examples of uh, that 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 were collected potentially off of YouTube and other places around um, or sent in from um, just ordinary citizens around the world who are experiencing climate-related extreme weather events, and they're unbelievable. I mean, for, from a visual perspective, um, it looks like computer graphically generated um, visual material. So um, in the film, we have a number of these examples, uh, both inside the slideshow and outside. The best example, I think, uh, came from a helicopter pilot in Greenland who was just flying his helicopter. And as he was flying over the Jakob Chauvin Glacier, he, he noted, uh, it was, this was the middle of April, which was quite early, that not only was it extremely hotter than normal, but that the glaciers were exploding and just, you know, kind of falling down in all of these different places as he cascaded over. So he pulled out his iPhone. He's like, this is incredible. I've been flying this for years. I've never seen this. 
and he just recorded it out the window. You'll see it in the film when you all go tonight to the movies. Um, it's, it looks like something out of the most beautifully directed, composed sci-fi film you've ever seen, and it's our world. And, and Joe, you know, I know in the work that you do, you know, you're thinking about how do we break these issues down for people? How do we make them relatable? So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how do you make climate feel relevant for people in their daily lives? And what are some examples that you've used that you feel like have really worked for your viewers? Well, one thing that we're able to do on YouTube and other creators know this is that, I mean, we look right at the camera. We're, we're already starting a conversation with the people who are watching our videos. It's, it's not a fly on the wall. I'm, I'm talking to them and I want them to talk back, you know, in the comments and, you know, hopefully be friendly. But uh, beyond that, you know, again, climate, climate science, climate change, the entire, all the issues that, that connect with this, they are so heavy. It is carrying around this big, heavy thing. And if we just tie that to one string and say that's science, we're just gonna say the science, the science is science. It's very hard to hold that. But if we can tie that to a bunch of other things, so I, I'll, I'll tie that to, uh, to biology, to nature, to their, uh, if you're a fan of geology or history or paleontology or uh, even psychology about how people think about climate change, we've, we've kind of approached this subject from all these different ways that helps us tie these other strings to, to make it more resonant with people, but give them another way to carry that and make it more, uh, more valuable to them so it doesn't feel just so heavy based on that one, maybe, maybe science, just isn't quite enough for everybody there. Yeah, and, and John, you were talking a little bit before about how this has really become a social justice issue for people, this become more personal, and one thing I think you guys did really well in the film was draw that connection of what is the impact that climate is really having on people's lives, you know, that really powerful footage about Super Typhoon Haiyan and how that impacted people, how Zika is impacting women and their families. Can you just talk a little bit more about how you think about that people-planet connection and what role that played for you guys and how you wanted to tell the story? Yeah, absolutely, and I think it, it dovetails with the discussion we're talking about um, in terms of user-generated video and um, the internet and the, 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 the clarity that, um, that we see the world with now because of the ability for people to broadcast from, you know, from their phones and um, is really incredible. It's, it's, it's amplifying uh, it, people's voices and, and it's allowing people to, I think, feel more closely connected to places that aren't necessarily right in their field of view in, in, in their home. And because of that, um, the fact that Mother Nature is screaming so loud is becoming more evident. You know, the, the, the climate crisis has grown worse, and the evidence of it is clear, and when it gets uploaded to YouTube, it's, hard, it's harder and harder to deny. It's, um, you know, the evil which has been perpetrated on, on our, on, particularly on American political system um, with the money from fossil fuel companies trying to confuse this issue is um, up against this giant truth out there, which is that people are noticing that the climate is changing. And um, so I think, uh, you know, that gets into the, very quickly gets into this realm where people uh, you know, are, are looking at, at, at their day-to-day -day lives um, either on their computer or in, in their actual lives and they're seeing, uh, they're seeing uh, evidence of something that they're being told uh, doesn't exist and so the two things aren't jiving. And so I think that um, it's becoming just clearer and clearer to people, especially as we live with the information over, over decades, that it is time to act, especially since the solutions are here and it's so easy to, to act. Absolutely. And, and for Vice President Gore, you know, you talk in, in both films about the, the blue planet image and that that's been an important one for you. That's how you started the slideshow for many years. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that power of ha being able to see the planet um, as well as tools that enable us to actually see the impacts of climate change over time like Google Earth Engine. Yeah, and Google Earth Engine uh, plays such a, an important role. But one of the challenges in dealing with the climate crisis is, is its scale, its magnitude, the time frames involved. And so seeing the Earth uh, as beautiful as it is, floating in the, in the void of space, helps people, I think, to shift their perspective away from the narrow short-term focus that most of us uh, sp spend time uh, dwelling on naturally 
and, and just uh, shift to th think about what's at stake here. When that image was first seen back uh, in, well, the first one was in uh, December of 1968 and then the blue marble in December of 1972, it had a really profound impact. Many of you are too young to, to, to remember what it was like back then. Nobody had ever seen an image like that before. And it really had a, a big effect. Within 18 months, the first Earth Day was organized and major environmental legislation was passed, the Clean Air Act, which actually now serves as the legislative basis for, for the Clean Power Plan uh, that states, at least, are implementing. California is moving forward. Um, so I just think that realizing we all share the same home, uh, it, it is now at, at risk, or at least the conditions uh, conducive to the flourishing of humanity are at, at risk. And having that uh, perspective, I think, is invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Bonnie, we were talking a little bit before about how you guys actually used YouTube a bit in the making of the film. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, just getting back to the user-generated yeah. videos that um, you'll see throughout the film, um, we knew that we were going certain places with Al where, you know, we, we looked at his schedule for the year and we thought we would go to certain places with him where we thought either, tra where we knew other trainings were happening or there were other reasons to go. Uh, Greenland, obviously, where um, he was going to be meeting with scientists and learning so much from these glaciologists about the state of the ice and, and such. Um, we did quite a bit of research on YouTube, YouTube about what kinds of user-generated material might be available in those locations. We knew we were going to be going to the Philippines, for example, to talk with survivors of Typhoon Haiyan. So we went onto YouTube to see what kinds of things we could find um, from the moment that the storm started, taken by people who had survived it, and it was incredible what was what we were able to find and um, the emotion that is packed into those. Um, really completely pure experiences when you see them in the film unadulterated by the directors or by Al Gore or anybody else um, you know the the authenticity of that is is unmatched yeah and and Joe I was curious you know I know um, you make you make stories about climate change, but also on other scientific issues. You know, as a YouTube creator, obviously you get comments, right? I would love to hear you talk a little bit about, have you noticed anything that's different about the kind of comments that you get when you're creating content around climate versus on other topics? No way. No. <laughs> There's certainly a lot more of them. Uh, you know, I think second place is probably any video about evolution, but... Um, <laughs> It really, you can tell you're striking a chord with people. And, and that is, uh, that, is an, uh, that shows us that something's happening there. Uh, you know, when, when, when a thought is held in your brain and it's tricky and it hurts a little bit, I mean, that's, that can be a really good thing. It means you're spending some time and, and challenge and challenging that, that whoever that viewer is. I mean, that's a really important moment. Um, we certainly get comments when I can tell people are helicoptering in who haven't really watched the video and just want to copy and paste something in there. But, um, we, we allow people to come in and do that and to have that experience and have that challenging experience. Um, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't uh, res kind of lean back on the science. We're, we're not, we, we put it out there. We, we're very clear and confident about what we know, but we let people have that conversation um, amongst themselves because I don't think we can ever really hit them over the head with it. We're going to let them have to take that journey for themselves. Hopefully we create a good place to do that and, uh, you know, with something educational up top. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So former Vice President Gore, I'd love to turn to the topic of, of technology for a moment. You know, and I think we have some of these emerging technologies, cloud computing, blockchain, machine learning. What are your thoughts on what impacts any of those technologies or other emerging technologies could have on the fight against climate change? If you look at the, the astonishing cost down curves, cost reduction curves for solar and wind, you now see a, a similar pattern with the cost reduction for, for batteries. Very, very exciting. Electric vehicles uh, and hundreds of exciting new efficiency 
technologies that don't have the sex appeal, if you will, and the recognition, but taken together are really huge. I have now come to the conclusion, and others have as well, that we are in the early stages of a global sustainability revolution, which has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. And instead of starting in a little corner of England in a world of one and a half billion people and slowly spreading outward, this sustainability revolution is being jump-started in rich and poor countries alike in every part of the world. And it's empowered by a lot of the new digital tools that enhance our uh, productivity and our ability. The Internet of Things is beginning to play a, a huge role. Uh, we're gaining the ability to, to deal with molecules and atoms that matches our ability to deal with bits of information. And as a result, we're seeing incredible improvements in efficiency of all kinds. Global emissions of uh, global warming pollution have actually stabilized and begun to come down a little bit over the last three years. They're coming down in, in the U.S., uh, in Europe, in China, uh, and in, in India, they've done a U-turn since the Paris Agreement. Uh, they're using low-cost credit now to vastly expand solar. They're closing lots of coal-burning plants. And they just announced that within only 13 years, 100% of all the cars and trucks sold in India are going to have to be electric vehicles. We ought to make a commitment like that here yes. in, in the United States. So, John, you know, I know one of the really iconic images that I know I was left with, many of us were left with from An Inconvenient Truth was the, the hockey stick chart of growing carbon emissions. Did you guys think at all about trying to have sort of an analogous image for this film? You know, what do you really want us to be left with? We have one. Yeah, all right. Well, yeah, please talk about it. Are you talking about chili? Yeah. Yep. yeah. <laughs> well, I think, Al, you should do the honors. It's right, your please, slide. Well, please, please. It, uh, it doesn't... It doesn't feature a, uh, a forklift or a man lift, as they call it in the, in the first movie. I was a little movie, disappointed about that. With the CO2 so. lines going way up on the right-hand side. But uh, there's an image that illustrates how quickly uh, the developing country, it's kind of an advanced developing country, Chile, they have great policy but a lot of poverty. And they have started uh, deploying solar. Michelle Bachelet, the president, is, does a terrific job. I worked with her in her first uh, tour of duty as president of Chile years ago, and she came in this time. And, and so it, it does the bar graphs with like, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but like 15 megawatts, and then 400 megawatts, 850 megawatts. And then the, then the uh, movie goes to, here's what they have under construction and approve for construction now. And the image goes up and up and up and up and up, just like that uh, image in the first movie, 13.3 gigawatts, and it just completely dwarfs the, the bar graphs that precede it. And, and what it illustrates is that they, they started slowly, but they realized they were saving money and cleaning the air at the same time. Awareness of the climate crisis in Chile is huge. They've had these... They had a million acres destroyed by fire uh, this year. They've had these record floods. One of them is in the movie. Both of those images are in the, in the movie. Um, and they just decided to get their policy right, and they have unleashed this incredible revolution. There was an economist, uh, the late uh, great Rudy Dornbush, uh, once said, things take longer to happen than you think they will, but then they happen much faster than you thought they could. And that is what is illustrated in that image in the movie. Takes, and, and if you look at global deployments of, of solar, it, 10 years ago with the first movie, we, were, we had this long flat line and it was just beginning to go up. And now in this movie, it goes shoot, just like that. And it, that's true of wind, it's true of all these sustainability technologies, and, and it's, it's very exciting. We can solve this. We're going to solve it. The remaining question is how quickly we will solve it, because more damage is being done 
every day, as the movie also illustrates. So it's a race ag against time, and we need to solve it uh, before we cross some of these tipping points that are dangerous and that are out there. Uh, and we need to, to minimize the damage that we hand off to, to the next generation, to, to many of you guys. You know, in the, as another piece of, uh, of evidence about this question that you asked about where we are and the technology of, of the solutions, this amazing thing happened in the movie that we actually didn't anticipate, which is that we go to Paris with Al and we're behind the scenes as the, the deal is, is underway and, and, it's not, and, no, and, and it's actually unsure whether there's going to be success in Paris uh, during the couple of weeks that, that world leaders and environmental ministers from all over the world that were in Paris negotiating this deal. And um, one of the kind of debates that's been going on at, at international levels when it comes to solving climate change is who's going to pay for it? Developing countries' basic stance has been for decades, look, we didn't cause the problem. You caused the problem in the West, the US, uh, Europe. You should pay for it. Um, and one thing you see in the movie, you see Al kind of talking to the Indian um, environmental minister and the energy in minister about these very things. And, and the debate gets very heated because people are entrenched and they, they, they believe that they're in the right and that the other side should, should have responsibility of dealing with it. But evidence that things are changing and changing very fast is the fact that the Indians actually did end up getting um, in, uh, signing on to the Paris deal. And like Al mentioned before, and they have made this U-turn. And in the context of international negotiations on this issue, which has been going on for decades, it is incredibly dramatic. And we have this wonderful material in the film where you actually see it happen in real time. Yeah. So uh, in closing for Vice President Gore, I just wanted to, to ask you, you know, speaking of this, this pace of change, you know, when you think of a decade from now, you know, let's say we're, we're back here in, in 2027, where do you think we'll be? Well, I hope we'll be able to look back on the preceding decade, the one just to come as we are here, as a time when we really did cross the tipping point. Um, I, I'm in awe of the talent that Bonnie and John uh, uh, brought to the making of this movie. I, I think it tells you everything you need to know about the crisis and the solutions and what you can do to be a part of the solutions. And the movie places this uh, climate movement in the context of the other great moral challenges that humanity has overcome. And they were mentioned earlier, the, the abolition movement a long time ago, but uh, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement. Uh, growing up in the South, I can tell you the resistance to the civil rights revolution was at least as ferocious as the resistance to the climate movement now. Um, the the uh, anti-apartheid movement. Nelson Mandela said it's always impossible until it's done. The gay rights movement. Um, if somebody had told me five years ago, uh, in the year 2017, gay marriage will be legal in all 50 states in the U.S. and will be accepted, honored, and celebrated by two-thirds of the American people, I would have said, well, I sure hope so, but what are you smoking? That seems <laughs> completely unrealistic. But it, it happened because once the underbrush is cleared away and the straw men are dealt with and the focus is clearly on the central choice between what's right and what's wrong, then the outcome becomes foreordained because of who we are as human beings. And I think the climate movement is right at that tipping point. And I feel pretty confident that a decade from now, we will have crossed that point. Uh, the climate denial will be sort of like the people who argue that the Earth is flat, or <laughs> there, there's still a bunch of those, evidently. <laughs> and uh, that, the, that the moon landing was, was faked on a movie lot and that kind of thing. But it will be a, a really marginal uh, point of view. And I, I think we're getting there. But not to put the focus on them, but rather to put the focus on all of us who take it into our hearts, realize it's the right thing to do, uh, and successfully resolving this is the key to, to redeeming our destiny as, as human beings and saying to the generations that follow, we did, we did the right thing. Yes. Well, thank, thank you all so much for being here with us. It's been truly an honor, and congratulations on the film. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you very thank you much. Thank you all for coming.